Hello, hello, hello. Welcome hey. to the Chasing Dreams podcast. Today, I have our special guest, Miss Kimberly Gomez, and we are talking about communication, okay? Yes. Y'all know it, listen, y'all know we need to talk about it. Uh, Kimberly <laughs> Gomez is a social worker and a doula. She graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University in May of 2016 with a bachelor's degree in social work. And she has trained with Birth Arts in International in October of 2018. She's usually sharing space and time with people during various transitions, changes, losses, and gains. She is drawn to exploring our spiritual health as a source of growth and evolution. Her passion lies in supportive education and holding space to allow healing through intimate conversation, ceremony, and care. Welcome to the podcast, Kimberly. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, and it's so interesting that you're a doula. Um, I think that that space is so necessary, particularly within the Black community. Yes. Um, so many women or mothers are dying during childbirth or our pain is not being acknowledged and things like that. Um, and even with me personally, like I miscarried twins in 2016. So I know um, when I do prepare for children, I'm like, okay, I need a, a, first of all, I need a black doctor. All of it. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I have been also considering the possibility of a doula just because you need someone who's actually going, like, I don't want to have to fight. Exactly. Um, And the, the, in my situation, um, I I had twins and Mm -hmm. one of the twins had been dead inside of me for six weeks. Mind you, I had two doctor's appointments since the time that they estimated the death. And And they didn't see it? Went home with sonograms and the whole kit and caboodle, every appointment. Wow. With allegedly pictures of both babies, but it was just, they didn't care enough. They knew it was twins, but didn't take the care of concern to look for both heartbeats. Um, And so then finding out on my birthday (laughs) that my son had been dead for six weeks. And oh, by the way, the placenta stopped because of the first miscarriage. And now you have brain damage in the the remaining. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So definitely one of those things we're like, why? And the only reason we eventually found out is because I had to fight for that advocacy. Um, Mm -hmm. I was 23 weeks when I missed, when I delivered them and Mm -hmm. my birthday fell on the 20 week mark. Um, So I'm thinking like, I'm halfway, we're good, all is well, you know, boom, bam, we're on a roll. Now I can breathe. You know what I mean? Like, cause you, you always on pivot. There's always a tense. Yeah. There's like a tension piece. And then I'm like, okay, halfway point, I should be good. Right. And I, so at this point I'm five months pregnant with twins and not, and barely showing like, like if you didn't, if I didn't lift my shirt to show you, you wouldn't, see you would have it, yeah. had no idea. And so I'm in the doctor, like, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm eating, I'm doing everything. I'm not gaining weight. Like what, what is going on? And they're like, Oh, it's your first pregnancy. Oh, you're naturally small. Oh, it, you know, it, because it's your first pregnancy, it's going to take a while for you to show and mm-hmm. you're so small as is. And you know, all of, like, just everything dismissing my concerns, because that was a concern I expressed at every appointment, like, mm, for this like, I'm not bit, really glowing. I should be a little bit bigger, like, not that I wanted to be bigger, but it was just a concern. But it's your intuition, too, right, and that's right. such a big part of being a doula, is not only the, we do definitely do the advocacy, but it's also, like, trust yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and in this experience, there's so many people around you, telling you like no you're fine that's just your whatever it's like you said so dismissive so like Mm -hmm. oh well maybe I'm just crazy or you know like it's just hormones right but it's like no when you have that person there to tell you like look your intuition is real yeah you deserve to be heard like I hear you I see your concern like let's explore it right and it might be nothing and let's just explore it you never know yeah like had they taken that concern serious the first time Maybe right. we would have known a lot sooner. And there was a surgery I could have had. Because basically what happened, they shared a placenta and the placenta had just stopped when the first mm. miscarriage happened. 
resulting in the brain damage. But there was a surgery that could have been done to transfer the placenta just to the one baby to minimize that damage. Had we known this the first time I said, mm, just negligence. honestly, like, you know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> but I'm down to talk about, you know, because doula stuff too, it's so rooted in communication, but not yeah. necessarily verbal, right? And I think yeah. that's where things get missed because we're so, our systems are just very used to, you have to have this very certain kind of verbal communication or you're not respected, you're not heard, you're just dismissed, unless you are very like, you need to speak how they speak in their language and that's it, right? And that's not right. fair. We're so different. We have so many different needs and stuff. And it's like tapping into that communication that is just body language. It is intuition that it's not necessarily seen or proven, right? But right. you know your gut. I know my right. gut, you know, and that's real and that's valid. And we don't have spaces for that, right? Yeah. Communication yeah. is so rigid. Everything we do is like, that's it, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. absolutely so what would you say is the dream for you mm, that's a good question I would love to be in some kind of space where there's like a collective energy right like that's that we're doing like barter system things like I love that kind of energy yeah. right where we can just come together because we all have skills to share with one another whatever they are right like even in speaking to people, that's such a gift and a skill that we can really share, you know, and I would love to be, to live in some kind of space where we're all um, kind of sharing those things, but doing that in a way to uplift each other, right? Like yeah. economically, financially, all of those things. Um, that's kind of um, where I work, uh, the Six Points Innovation Center. So we are a collective of organizations. And it's interesting to work in that way, especially serving young people, because we know there's so many different facets of what we need to do. Right. Um, so we're, we're a collective of different organizations. Everybody has their piece of the pie, but we come together, right, to, to serve one main thing, you know? Yeah. And I love that. To me, I feel like that's holistic. That's, mm-hmm. that's what we need to be doing to, to really be able to support people in, like, a very real way. Yes, 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 yes. And I definitely... Agree. I think that's where a lot of other um, cultures really are able to get that that advantage because they they work collectively. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say, it's easy to say that the Black community doesn't do that, but we also have to look at the history. Like right. even thinking back to like Black Wall Street, like that's exactly what that was. You have right. black teachers, black doctors, black lawyers, like everything that you need in one central location, and then they bonded. Exactly. You know what I mean? So, exactly. While it's easy to say, well, we need to come together, it's like historically, every time we've tried, we, do, and we have, you know. Right. Every and even if you look before we're, our history here in this country, our yeah. history elsewhere, so much so, you know, yeah, like for sure. For sure. And, and that's, and that's evident when you look at um, Caribbean Americans or um, Africans who grew up in Africa and then came to America, like they have mm-hmm. a whole different perspective um, versus African Americans who, you know, have the history of slavery and Jim Crow and civil rights issues and, yeah. you know, all of the things. Um, but I say that to say, uh, when you see Caribbeans who or who are ch- uh, children of immigrants um, or Africans who are children of immigrants into the country, they don't they grow up thinking like, yeah, this is what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And I think it That's- really goes to speak to the American history side of it. Um, and we can't, as African Americans, be so critical of ourselves without understanding that history. It's funny you mention that because my my family's from the Caribbean. We're from the Dominican Republic. Mm-hmm. And it's such a different, I was born here, right? So like you're saying, I have such a dual experience, right? Because I exist here. Um, I mean, this is a whole nother conversation about blackness in the, in the world, right? But I exist as a black woman, right? Yeah. My family, we speak Spanish also. And that's such a dual experience because, and I say this all the time to my, to my black American friends where it's like, there are some things that we do 
our, our identity and existence is, is here, it's meshed, and then some things are just not, right? Because it's, like you said, a very unique American experience, yeah. you know, where it's like the, the upbringing, like I had that, right? But my parents and what they instilled with me was completely different, you know? the history and of course we had slavery there too right so we yeah. have the remnants but it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's just a whole different it's worldview it got to america and just blew up <laughs> and then it's the way they teach it here and yeah. of course they teach it everywhere it's not taught the way it needs to be taught right like everywhere is anti-black as hell <laughs> you know but, but there's this um glamorization that is taught in american history um mm-hmm. and it's <laughs> it's really whitewashed and that's just there there's no other way around it i remember i have a a younger sister who's we're 10 years apart Mm. and she was always academically you know a student you know all of the things really good in school and i remember her being shocked to find out that egypt was in africa and it's not that she wasn't Mm -hmm. she, she actually enjoyed history class but when you look at the history books, they try to push it as far up towards Europe as possible. As possible. And then when you look at the pictures, the kings and queens are white and the slaves are black. It's like, y'all, that's, y'all not going to act like it's not in Africa. Like, you're not. <laughs> I still have conversations to this day where people are, like, surprised about that, right? Where it's yeah. like, oh, I kind of knew that, but I don't think I ever... Life it and talk about it. Exactly. And it's, it's one of those things where like, okay, fine. Since we can't pretend like they're not wealthy, let's pretend like they're not Africa. <laughs> you exactly. Know I mean? Like, if they're you really live like... in the middle of Africa, what would you do then? You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, what now? Well, they're um, different because they're right in the middle, so. <laughs> exactly. But it's, it, it's just really the reality that, mm-hmm. um, and then like just what they're choosing to portray um, and you even see it today with everything that's going on with the riots and the protests and things like that. Um, I literally saw a video of a white woman looting in a store and they were like, um, I mean, maybe she's a, maybe she's an employee there. And, you know, like uh, maybe she's just, you know, leaving from work for the day. It's just the benefit of the doubt. We're just so willing to always. But then you, I can't even walk past the store without getting the side eye. <laughs> it's like, bruh. And when, <laughs> I'm a, it's oh, real. Girl, yeah. It's, that's very true. It it's just really the just, visuals of it is completely. Exactly. And it's, it's one of those things where I think the advantage to um, like Caribbean Americans or um, Africans who are children of immigrants the advantage is you don't grow up with that lineage and that baggage that's passed along um so like my grandmother was alive during the civil rights movement you know what I mean like how did Mm -hmm. that influence and not only that but the great depression how did that influence her parenting which then influenced my mother's parenting you know what I mean like how those those patterns that are passed along um because we're literally fighting for survival (laughs) right and survival of the fittest right and so then that begins to be passed along but when you're first generation american you don't have anything being passed down um well not that you don't have anything being passed down but you don't have that back that same level of baggage from generation to generation to generation to generation yeah right we have different generational stuff yeah yeah (laughs) there's a whole nother set of baggage but yeah you know the thing is and it's so recent right and that's what we forget right where it's literally our grandparents it's our grandparents (laughs) which like you said influenced our parents which influenced how they raised it's not some like boogeyman thousands of they, and that's part of the narrative too is like exactly. when you see pictures of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and oh they're all you know, faded they look so old like nah they bro that was black and white. yeah <laughs> they want you to feel like it was so long ago like Bernie Sanders marched with King like exactly what it's just because you know what it is it's that it's like all of our all of our leaders die they all die yeah. so yeah. Well, where they're always mortalized murdered. and murdered <laughs> murdered honestly murdered. Yeah. <laughs> Murdered, assassinated, yes. taken out, you yes. know, strategically taken out. Correct. So we're always, we always see them kind of in this place of like, they they died young. So we don't realize that they could have still been alive. Yeah. A lot of people could have still very well been alive to this yeah. day, leading us and moving us, right? But yeah. that's why they're not. Yeah. 
they're not because they chose to take a stand. Um, and it's really a fear tactic. So if I take out your leader, by default, you're going to question whether you That's should it. continue. For sure, for sure. So we talked about your dream a little bit. When did you realize your dream and how has it changed over the years for you? Yeah, so actually becoming a doula is something that came to me um, a little before 2018 when I went to the training, but it felt like something that I wasn't necessarily, I didn't think I would be into that. You know, like I, I've never been um, like a very touchy person. You know, I've, I'm not really like, I am a hugger now, <laughs> you know, but before I was kind of standoffish, right? Yeah. Um, and so I kept being called to becoming a doula though, like just being interested in it and kind of how we were talking about um, this generational thing, right? Like, that hits me so deep in my core, you know, like that just feels like purpose for me, right? Like to, to support this generational lineage, because that's the only way we're going to really uplift ourselves, right? We have to start with not only the way that we're bringing children into the world, right? But our elders and, and yeah. connecting those, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it just kind of kept coming to me and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. If it's coming to me, it must be for a reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> And just through this, it's been such a like, you know, uh, eye opening of the things that scare you are probably what you're supposed to be called to do, right? Like they scare you for a reason, you know. <laughs> you preaching to the choir, child. I just say, yes. But it's hard, right? It's for yeah. me. It was like Ugh, I don't want to do that. That's so out of my thing. Like I don't really even like to be looked at or whatever yeah. right like I like to be reserved but it's like no sometimes you need to step out and do things you're being called for a reason yeah you know yeah and don't allow your personality right to sacrifice your purpose that's beautifully said honestly yeah <laughs> yeah and I'm the same way like I'm naturally shy I'm naturally introverted I'm super same. quiet um, so for me to be a motivational speaker um, and even to be an author um, and putting my story out there, like that's yeah. scary. But what I've realized is the things that scare you are the exact things that you're supposed to be doing um, and learning to recognize that fear is just an emotion, just like everything, right. everything else. else. Everything right. else. Um, but and just learning how to mitigate it. So like when I have speaking engagements, like my phone is on silent before and after, like, I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I'm aware of what my energy needs are. So I'm either, you know, spending time in silence or I'm listening to like, it's usually Beyonce, you know, whatever I need. Um, and then afterwards, I eat some fried chicken and I go to sleep. <laughs> and I take a nap. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's so but funny. I that's so funny. That, like, me being, and that's honestly how introverted I am. Like, when I pour into people, like, I'm exhausted afterwards. Like, exhausted. But I can't let that stop my purpose. I still have to go out there and do it. I just have to know. Like, if I happen to speak an engagement, I'm not doing nothing else the rest of the day. Like, nothing. My nothing. whole schedule is blocked for one day. <laughs> the whole day is done. That's what I did for the day. That's what yeah. I did. Yeah. But you know, and about communication, right? Like, I think that's something that kept coming to me too, thinking about communication. Boundaries are so important in, in how we communicate and what we communicate. <laughs> I'm gonna just go ahead and pass the collection plate because listen, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, but we have to, right? Because like you said, we cannot, I can't do what I need to do if I don't set these boundaries. And not only setting them, but communicating them to ourselves and like, okay, it's okay for me to have these boundaries. I know it feels uncomfortable because we live in a society that praises not having boundaries. We praise being exhausted. We praise literally pouring yourself out until you have nothing else to give. And it's no a badge of honor in our society. And I, yes. I don't want it. I don't want it. You can keep it. <laughs> you can keep that prize, okay? <laughs> um, and I... I remember seeing a tweet and it was like, um, my boundaries were created to honor me, not to yes. offend you. And that's the thing. Like when people set boundaries, we have to stop taking it as a personal attack. It ain't about you. It's never about you. you it's right. about what I need in this exactly. moment. Um, like I will never forget. I, um, like when I'm really stressed and overwhelmed or even when I'm just busy, I'll put my phone on do not disturb. 
the message still comes through. I'll still see everything, but mm-hmm. I don't want to be distracted by just them popping up. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then there are some people who are boundary adverse in my life, and they're like, "Well, okay. you want straight to voicemail?" Uh, okay. That mean I can't talk. <laughs> right. Like, that means I'm unavailable. And as soon as I'm free, I'd be happy to return that phone call. Right. And it has nothing to do. I didn't know you were going to call at that moment. It has nothing to do with you. Right. But it has everything to do with what I need in this moment. Mm-hmm. And what I need is to not be distracted by my phone right now. And, you know, I feel like that's good. I have people like that, too, where I've tried to set boundaries. And it's just like a very like, oh, type of reaction. How, how dare you set a boundary? And to me, that's good information, right? Like you gave me good information to know about you. And usually it's that that person doesn't have boundaries. Yeah. And yeah. we're reflecting something in them where they're like, oh, like <laughs> that feels weird. That feels uncomfortable. Yeah. So I'm just going to react. Yeah. And what I've had to learn is like, just because you don't have boundaries, does not do mean I'm not going to set them with you. Exactly. That's your choice. It's up to you whether you decide right. to have boundaries or not. I'm going to be honest. However, as for me and my house, we have boundaries. 100%. And by my house, I mean me. But, you know. <laughs> but still, my house. Yeah. Yes, my house. <laughs> okay. Chat. You have to put, especially when you, when what you do, and I think sometimes people don't understand if they're, if they're not constantly um, doing work that pours into people, right? Like, and that's a different feeling, right? Because especially social worker doula, that's what I do, right? Like spending time, you really do pour yourself out. You, yeah. you almost even like open a cavity in yourself, right? Yeah. To just allow, you know, and that's so much, that's labor, that's energy that's going through you, like you said. And if you don't, I've been there, right? Like when I first started being a social worker and I first graduated, I dove head in and girl, I started breaking out into hives out of stress. Like literally my body was like, girl, you're taking on too much. Right. And I think a lot of us have these physical reactions, but they may be more subtle and we just, whatever, like, Oh, I've had a headache for like years, but whatever, (laughs) you know, it's like, that might be kind of stress. (laughs) That's not okay. I don't, I don't think that's that's how that's supposed to work. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, you had a yeah. crack in your neck for the last five years, baby. That's stress. That's stress. You need that's a massage. Stress. You need to take some days off. You know, but I felt so guilty, right? Because it's like, like you said, it's about the honor. And then you know, being a social worker, it's like there's so much to do, right? Like yeah. there's so much need that if you're not going to every meeting, you're not going to everything, every whatever. It's like, oh, well, you're not really doing everything you can. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. wow. Well, what else can I do? you know <laughs> yeah, exactly and it's that pressure that like the world needs me and it's like I under I, I need fully me. recognize that the world needs me but I promise you my first two to three hours of my day are for me because the world people. is not gonna have me if I don't do that hello <laughs> okay and that's <laughs> that. so what does it mean to have healthy communication habits mm. So I think especially for healthy communication is just listening, right? Like knowing how to really listen. We don't know how to do that either. (laughs) Okay. You know, we just know how to listen to respond. We know how to listen and like, oh, well, I'm thinking this about what they're saying, you know, but truly and it's almost almost as if we're listening for that pause, right? Right. It's like, okay, this is what I'm about to say. And as As soon as you start, (laughs) boom. And it's like that had nothing to do with us. <laughs> even do it, so you're. I know you're not even paying attention to me. You're just in your head, and you're just gonna project out yeah. whatever. It is. Yeah, and I've mm-hmm. actually had to catch my best friend on that. Um, and we'll be having a conversation, and he'll say something completely like, like slightly related, but like, and I'm, I'm like, you realize that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, right? Like and at least like, say, hey, I'm about to say something unrelated, right? Like at least tell at least me, no, exactly. At least acknowledge that we're making a pivot, but you say, <laughs> in re- like, what what I think is in response to what I just said, and it's but just really not it's at just, all. you waited for a break in the conversation to say whatever you was going to say anyway. Anyways. Okay. And honestly, I see this a lot, with, right, with the youth, where 
I think people see young people in general, right? Like, I don't even think just this generation. I think this is just how young people are always seen as just angsty, right? Like, angsty, angry. But really, it's just that they just want to be heard. And there's so many people around them that, especially because they're young, it's just like, oh, well, you don't really know what you're talking about. Or, you know, just not listening to what they're really saying. And then be confused about why they're angsty and angry, you know? And I think with communication, that's we need to really see each other and really hear each other because what if not we're just talking to each other you know like we're just saying words at each other and not connecting we're not moving you know like it's not it's not producing anything yeah and that's so 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 true like children honestly that's where the ideas are like (laughs) they're so bright they're so bright and so creative and so exciting and we're such a society where we try to force norms on our children Mm -hmm. um but if you didn't maybe if you didn't like those are the children that are gonna change the world but you know i see that a lot as a doula too where we have so many just like expectations and honestly a lot of it right like everything comes back to history because everything is generational everything comes from somewhere right so right? Like we were systemically removed from our babies. So we do have this disconnect, right? Where it's like, where we, as the black community, we feel like we always have to kind of control them for their own safety, yeah. right? Which I understand. We still do have to, have to do that to this day as we see, right? But there's a level of like, like you said, we kind of just like push them down, like push all the creativity down. Like, don't do that. Don't run. Don't do this. And it's like, I understand needing to have control of your house space, right? But like the, the ways the treat babies. Yeah, and what I've realized is like I don't have children that I'm raising, but I do have eight nieces and nephews, and then I also coach cheerleading, so That's I have cute. consistent interaction with children, right? Mm-hmm. But what I've learned is that if you communicate (laughs) Uh aha and Mm -hmm. even when it's a safety concern like really taking the moment to say i don't want you to do this because this is what because exactly not Not just just don't do that because i said so right that's not learning any lessons and they don't all they learn is obedience exactly by threat of i'm gonna beat you right i'm gonna get as opposed to before you before you cross the street, these are the things you need to look for. Not just if you run that street, I'm gonna beat you up. Right, right. But you know, and that goes into critically thinking, right? Yeah. Like, and that helps yeah. the child develop critical thinking skills right. on their own, as opposed to now they're 25 and calling you because they need to fill out medical paperwork, <laughs> and you like, well, you grown, you supposed to be able to do. Well, when did they learn? Who taught you? Exactly. All they learned is how to obey just to avoid punishment. Yeah. It's like we treat them like this this subservient level until they're like 17. And then as soon as they turn 18, it's like, oh, you've grown. You can do everything on your own. And it's like, where are the how? lessons? Like, well, kind how? Of how? <laughs> like yeah. I'm 28. I'll be 29 this year. And I still don't feel like a whole adult. So, I'm, yeah. I'm still trying to figure some of this stuff out. Like... <laughs> I'm supposed to do what now? Right, like what is planning? Like, like, I'm I, just mastering <laughs> washing your clothes and putting them away in the same day. Oh, I'm, I'm just getting. I'm still paid. not at the same day. I'm at okay. like a couple. <laughs> like, I, and and that's like as of the last couple of months. <laughs> like, you know, what I mean? like there's just certain like because it's it's overwhelming when mm-hmm. the bandaid is ripped off at 18, and you're like mm-hmm. forced into this world like fly little birdie like. Right. You're like, I don't know how, how? Do you know? <laughs> how do I do any of this stuff? Yeah. So what are some of the challenges of poor communication skills? Hmm. I think kind of like um how we were talking about before, where it just doesn't it doesn't lead it to anything, you know, it, it ends up feeling like this ping pong back and forth, right? Like of okay, I know what I'm saying. Yeah. You're not hearing it, it's not getting to you. And then it's coming back to me and it's just, right? Like, it's just not, it's not flowing. It's not moving, Yeah. you know? Um, and I think that, accomplish. right, you know? And I think that goes into really being like intentional about what are we, right? Like, I think we've kind of gotten like loose with work, right? Like we just kind of talk just to talk. I think social media kind of does that a little bit too, that we're 
we always have access to talking to people and people yeah. talking to us, yeah. you know? So I think we're not as intentional about it. Even like you said, with our boundaries, right? Where people feel like they can access us at all times because they can now, because we have bees, right? <laughs> Back in the day, you couldn't holler at me unless I was at the house, you know? Okay. And unless then I, I could just unplug the phone and <laughs> still go about my day. You know, that's and it. I have no idea where I am, where nowadays, um, I think, I am I'm pro technology so I'm not going to sit here and sure. say technology has not been good for us but I think one of the downfalls of technology developing is the reality that there's almost too much access too much I agree yeah like, that's why you have to have boundaries you feel a way because my phone was off for an hour baby that's something you need to go deal with <laughs> people that are close to me just know that now because it's like you know even like and that's it's hard to have those conversations with family right but like I've had them even with mom and stuff right like of course if my mom needs me she can call me and I might answer right <laughs> but she knows if I don't just text me and I'll probably I just you know like it's it's a it's like a little bubble right where I need to be prepared to come out of it and there's nothing wrong with that yeah. you know yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And it's like, we just have to learn how to say those things to people, which can be difficult, you know, like actually saying, hey, can you please do this for me? I know it feels weird, but, you know, and if they respect you, they'll do it, yeah. you know? Yeah, and that's the thing that about setting boundaries is the earlier you set them, the easier it is to set. Right. So an example of that, um, my best friend, had some challenges with his wife as far as like cleanliness um mm. and surprisingly enough he was the clean one <laughs> um, wow. and um you know I'll let you deduce what you want from that one I but know. <laughs> one of his biggest issues was well she always bringing her shoes in the house and I'm like well when did you verbally communicate please take your shoes off right and he's like well I try but then she makes it seem like I'm you know acting brand new and I said mm. well if you told her four years into a relationship it is kind you of are. <laughs> it's true you are acting brand new um yeah. to be honest and i you know i gave him the example um i had visited somebody and this was the first time i was in their house mm-hmm. and the second i walked in the door he's like you gonna take your shoes off cool no problem and i just need to I, know that's a rule right and every time i walked in after that like i naturally went and took off my shoes and i think there was one time i forgot and he's like um your shoes you know what I mean? And, and so it wasn't a fight. It was like, you've already communicated this boundary. Cool. I'm going to respect it. And you know what it is, too? And that goes into poor communication, too. It's how we how we say things. Right? Yeah. yeah. Which I struggle with sometimes, right? Because sometimes things come out very, like, and then it's like, okay, I can't expect people I have said to, that better. Right? Because I know if somebody snapped at me, I'm a snap, right? So right. it's like, how can I communicate something? And that's about communicating when we're not necessarily in the heat of the moment you yeah. know like maybe being like okay I need to address this if I address it now I know it's going to be filled with my emotion yeah. right which isn't necessarily a bad thing but it shouldn't be projected you know yeah. like how can I communicate this in a way that's not accusatory I'm not like blaming I'm not being mean spirited I'm just saying hey I wanted this you did this can you please do this in the future right and that's all it has to be yeah, and communicating in a way where they actually hear you, um, because a lot of times when you snap at people, you're triggering their fight or flight response. Right, right? and you gonna get one of the two. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> They're either going to fight or leave, and 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 you have to as the the you have to be able to like hold yourself accountable and say mm-hmm. like, could I have done that differently? Right. You know what I mean um and really and I had I had to hold myself accountable recently um I had a friend who we were you know it's a new friendship but we were starting to get close and spending all the time and then he goes ghost for a couple of weeks mm-hmm. well the root of it is he just started a new job which I didn't know but like in my mind I'm like you can't answer a text message you on yeah. Instagram you you didn't see my DM you know what I mean like I'm like you saw it like at what point you know <laughs> that's funny so when I ended up seeing this person again, I responded with sarcasm. Mm-hmm. And immediately I was like, that wasn't even necessary. Like it just wasn't even necessary. And so I had yeah. to go back and then be like, hey, like I sent another message. I said, okay, this is the last time I'm going to try. <laughs> but I sent a message and was like, 
I want, you know, are you available this day at this time? I miss you. Yeah. Because that's where the, sar- the sarcasm was coming from. It was my yeah. defense mechanism. But at the root of it, I just missed my friend. Yeah. And, and vulnerability. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Being and sometimes we have yeah. to be willing to um, push through the emotion and communicate mm-hmm. in a way that gets your point across. Right. Because like you said, you know, we, when we get triggered and a lot of times we're triggered and it has, like you said, nothing to do with the person, right? Like they're just triggering something, whether it's our, we hate being rejected or, you know, like all of these things that come up in us, right? That people are just living their lives, but things that they do affect us in this way, you know? And like you said, we have these reactions. They may not even know. They may not even know that history or that pattern. So you're more sensitive to this particular thing Mm -hmm. because of everybody else that that did it. And they do it not even knowing that that's a trigger for you. And now you popping off. When like, like, hello. (laughs) uh, I didn't do all of the other things that you mad about. Right. This one thing. And I didn't even realize that I was falling into a pattern of your past. Right. And you do kind of have to give people that grace, right? Like that. If I have, especially if you have not communicated it, right? Like if you have not said, hey, this kind of bothers me. Or can you just let me know? Or right, like just reaching out and saying what you feel and what you mean. You know, where that I miss you. Not like, mm. <laughs> you know, there's a difference. Okay, because I'm good for sarcasm, but <laughs> I'm good. looking like it, there's better ways to communicate to get what you want. Like, yes, I can be sarcastic, but that's not going to give me the end result that I want because now they just going to feel away. Right. Right. So what are some ways that we can develop better patterns in our communication? Um, I think really just trying to stay present as much as we can. You know, that's something that I try to practice all the time. It's just, even if I have a million things going on, right? Like if I'm having a conversation with somebody, I need to get myself in a place where that's, that's where I'm at. You know, like I'm here with the person, um, practicing like eye contact you know I think for some people that's really uncomfortable to do (laughs) and sometimes even talking to me and I hold eye contact and I notice some people kind of look away and stuff and I think that's something that can keep us so connected and present right like when we're having a conversation how else like you know I see you because I'm looking right at you you know and I know some people right like there might just be uncomfort with it and I respect that, right? Like, I don't need you to look in my eyes the whole time. But I think practicing that definitely does help um, just feel comfortable, right? Like, not only seeing the other person, but having somebody, like, see you, Mm -hmm. you know? That's so powerful because we go around kind of blocked, right? Like, all these kind of barriers or walls that we have up because, like you said, things in our past and we've been her and we've been this. So we bring all of that into our communications with people, you know? But as much as we can just be like, okay, we're in this moment. My baggage doesn't exist. You know, like nothing else exists except for this time right now. And I'm going to just really feel what they're saying, you know? Yeah. yeah, for sure. That is so, so key. What would you say is your number one secret to success? Mm, I don't know if I found it yet. <laughs> okay, okay. That is honest. I'll take it. <laughs> Yes, I think something that does definitely help me, though, just always have the um, motivation to keep going, right, is is this energetic, and when I say spirit, I mean mostly just like purpose, right, like whatever that means to an individual, I know it, it can be, have its own baggage, right, like that word spirit, for, for good reasons, you know, um, but I really feel like connecting to whatever is our purpose here, whatever, whatever makes us feel meaningful, whatever makes us feel important and, and like we deserve to be on this world doing what we love. We really need to connect to that source, you know, because that's what drives us, right? Like for some people it's ancestors, Mm -hmm. for some people it's prayer, you know, all of these things, they center us, right? Like they remind us that we're here, we've been here, like generationally and we have so much farther to go right so we need to find a way to like ground ourselves and root ourselves in this moment yeah. but use the strength of everything else around us you know like there's been strife before 
So how can we use that, right? Like to support us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is so key. And I think one phrase I would love to retire is I'm not my ancestors as like a slant. Like if you really are I'm fully my ancestors. Okay. Like if you really understood what that what our ancestors went through, you right, you're not your ancestor, because they're a whole lot stronger. <laughs> You would not be out there. Like, all the people that... We live with air conditioning now. Y'all telling me y'all would be... Like, that like, in and of itself. Like, baby, you have plumbing now. Like, relax. Relax. So funny. Okay. <laughs> it's true, though. I, yeah, I would... I feel like that's so disrespectful to say. Like, you wouldn't even be here if they... We are all here because all of our ancestors survived. Okay. That period. Like, that's okay. it. Like, there were... <laughs> many of people who were enslaved that didn't even make it to America. Exactly. Like, please, please stop playing with me. It's true. Because on behalf yeah, I, of my ancestors, I'm I will. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's one thing to say, like, like the phrase, like, I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams. I think that's mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. Because I think the reason they fought for survival is because they knew it could be better. Right. Like, that... Yeah to me shows that you understand what they went through and that you understand that um, to even have the ability to think about self-care <laughs> to take care of ourselves to be able to take baths you know what and, I mean you know yes like candles and like yes, yes that is a sure. we, dream that our ancestors fought for absolutely right. but right. to say like oh I'm not my ancestors you know I, I could never but to me all that says is that you just don't have a connection with your ancestors you know because no matter what your ancestors did and this is something too right where i feel like all people right like even even white folks european folks like everybody kind of needs to attach to ancestors so that we can as much as we generate um generational trauma we need to transmute generational healing right like we need to go back and heal but we all need to revisit our ancestry like I why would you you are your ancestors it doesn't matter what they did or they didn't do you are them right like and and that's where the healing comes from because nobody in our families is perfect right like were there ancestors that maybe probably should have done more or maybe were some kind of asshole or something right like there's there's ancestry isn't supposed to be perfect right right like they're people yeah. and we learn from everything that they did good right wrong and different you know and that's where that healing comes from because whatever lessons was theirs are still ours and we need to heal them you know to keep going absolutely and even if you disagree with what they did um you still have to have respect and reverence for the fight that they were fighting because in that moment right. it, that was their that's what that they was what was necessary right. for example um like the separate but equal fight right i believe we should have been fighting for equal mm-hmm. <laughs> you can keep us separate but let's yeah. make sure we got equal funding and you know all of the things because i think integration was and of course this is hindsight right mm-hmm. but i think integration was not really beneficial for our community because then we started fighting for a seat at their table right and completely forgot about the importance of having our own our table. own i agree so, but again, that's hindsight 2020. Like they right. fought for what they thought was what best. What they thought, them. exactly, exactly. Like, I, I still, even though I disagree, like I'm disagreeing after seeing the results. Exactly. And not in the moment of, right? Like they have been kept separate for so long that of course, right? Like that's, like you said, you can't take things out of the moment that they existed, you know? And I think like all of these people saying that they're looking, like you said, with our eyes mm-hmm. in that moment. Like, oh, I would have, or I should. You wouldn't have done none of that. <laughs> you don't know what you would have did, exactly. The reality is the same thing you're doing now is the same thing you would have been now. Right. So, and always be the loudest people that don't be doing nothing. <laughs> okay. Child. I know, that's a whole nother conversation okay. though. <laughs> well, what final thoughts do you have for us as an audience? Hmm, I just really... um want to thank you for this conversation it was oh, thank you lovely. yes and I think just the idea of really chasing dreams I'm, I'm happy that you are um pursuing that right because I think I really do think dreams is where 
we make things happen, you know, if we don't allow ourselves, because if we, you know, like as a social worker, that's what I see with a lot of folks when, when they kind of reach that, that like low place in their lives, it's because dreams have been completely taken away from them, right? It's like, not only can you not dream for like a, a really good life, you, you're not even able to dream of like a regular stable life. Yeah, especially if you've been in so much trauma, so much, you know, and, and when you're not able to picture yourself in that moment anymore, you can't reach it. You have nothing to like look forward to. You, it, it's, it's hard to attach to it, you know? Um, so yeah, I just love that idea of, you know, we really do need to, to support our dreams and whatever that means. Like, and I'm always talking to youth, like think of the craziest thing you can think of we might not be able to do the craziest thing right but let's see what logical steps we can make right because things are possible and once we can once we believe that we can make these things possible that's it right like and that's and that's really where that kind of like opening comes from you know if if we stop the like oh i can't do that i'll never be able to do that i'll never reach that place you know it's like why yeah why not yeah. And that's what I work with a lot of my coaching clients with is like, let's start with the big picture, but let's break it down into actionable steps. Like if that's the dream, cool. Now let's figure out how to get there. Right. But it's not going to be from step A to step Z. There's a whole bunch of steps that mm-hmm. you can go in between, but each day you could be working just to move a little bit closer. Right. A little bit closer. Right. Every single day. And even if it's small stuff like reading yeah. something about what you're interested in, informing yourself or, you know, practicing something, you know, and I think that's something too. We, um, I know it happens to me sometimes. That's why I have to stay off social media because it's like all we see is other people's lives, other yeah. people's dreams manifesting. Yeah. So we kind of, it kind of clouds us, right? It's kind of like, oh, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Why am I not, why am I not there yet? Why? I'm, but we don't see anything else. We don't know this don't person. You don't see the hard part. You don't see what they've been through to get here. You don't see it, right? So, and not only that, but you don't really know what that dream is like in real life. You don't know if that's really your dream, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And just recognizing that social media is the highlight reel. Right. People ain't putting their failures on Instagram. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So, and they are so much part of it. If you don't fail, you know, like you're you don't not really learn. Learn. Exactly. Exactly. For sure. So where can people find you if they want to learn more about what you have going on? Let us know. Yeah, so you can follow me on IG. It's Kimism. Um, that's K-I-M-I-Z-M and there's an underscore at the bottom. Love it, love yeah. it, love it. Well, thank you so much for being thank part you. of the podcast. This was a great conversation. I, I had such a good time. Yes, thank you, thank you. And we'll see you next week, guys. <laughs>